All right, so I heard a story one time about a lady who went to a pet store. And while she was in the pet store, she noticed a big cage with a parrot inside. And so she went up to the cage and she looked that parrot, I mean square in the eyes, and the parrot looked at her and said, Hey you, you're ugly. <laughs> hey you, you're ugly. Well, man, the lady was just absolutely taken back by that. She was furious. And so she went and she found one of the store managers. And she told the manager exactly what that bird had said to her. And so, man, the, the store manager, he was furious. He went over to the parrot cage and he, he took the parrot out. And I mean, he just absolutely wore that parrot out. I mean, just beat the feathers off of it and threw it back in the cage. And he told the lady, he said, I assure you that bird won't say anything like that to you ever again. Well, the lady, she was like, well, I appreciate you handling this situation. And she left. Well, a couple of days later, her current curiosity got the best of her. She started thinking, man, you know, I wonder if that bird has really changed. So she went back into that same, that same pet store and, and went back to where that big cage was and the bird was still there. They hadn't sold it yet. And so she went up and she looked that parrot square in the eyes one more time and this time the parrot just sat there and looked at her. Didn't say a word. And so very smugly, she said, hmm, well, I guess he learned his lesson. And as she began to walk off, the parrot said, hey, you. And she whipped around, and he said, you know. <laughs> Let me ask you a question this morning. How many of you have ever said something that you really wish you hadn't have said? How many of you have moments, go ahead and keep your hand up and everybody look around. How many of you have moments where you struggle with your tongue? Everybody look around, right? I mean, we all have our moments. We all have those times where we struggle. I mean, if I'm honest with you this morning, there are a lot of things that I've done that I wish I could go back and undo. But there is an even longer list of things that I have said that, man, I wish I could go back and just take all those things back. But you know what? This is, this is a human thing. This is something that each and every one of us, we struggle with. In fact, if you get into the scriptures, what you will find is that there were men and women of God, even back in, in Bible days, that really struggled with their tongue. For example, how many of you know Moses? How many, how many of you have ever heard that biblical name before? Great leader, probably the most humble guy. I, I, I mean, he is just this phenomenal godly man. But in Psalm chapter 106, verse 33, this is what's said about Moses. The people of Israel made him so angry that he watched church. He spoke foolishly. In other words, Moses, this godly man, he had a moment when he said something that he shouldn't have said. If you look at Numbers chapter 12, starting in verse 1, you also read about Moses' sister, Miriam. And no doubt she was another godly individual. But in verse 1, it talks about how she was jealous of her brother Moses. Because people were looking to him instead of looking to her and looking to her other brother, Aaron. And so it says that she and Aaron began to criticize Moses. And it got to the point to where God was so angry with Miriam that he inflicted her with leprosy. Also, we could look at Isaiah. Remember the prophet Isaiah? And, and Isaiah, remember, has that vision where he is in heaven and he is standing before the presence of a holy God. And this is what he says, Woe is me. He says, I have what, church? Unclean lips. And he says, Woe is me because I dwell in a land of what? People with what? Unclean lips. Okay, so this is nothing new, right? I mean, you and I, as, as humans, we, we struggle. 
not to say things that we shouldn't say. And that's really what this new series is all about. What I want us to do is I want us to begin a series today entitled Words Matter. And what I want us to do in this series is I want us to get to the point to where we really think before we speak. Okay, because like I said, our words really do matter. Look with me at James chapter 3. James chapter 3, normally I put the scriptures up here on the board. I'm not, I'm not going to put this particular text up there. It's, it's too lengthy. If there was a text that you would turn to to see what God has to say about the tongue, James chapter 3 would be that text. But here's the deal, what a lot of people don't realize is really throughout the entire book of James, James is dealing with the tongue. Chapter 3 really just gets most of the focus as, as far as the tongue is concerned, but the entire book is all about the tongue. He talks about the good things that our tongues are capable of. For example, chapter 1 verse 5. He says we can call on God for wisdom with the tongue. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. In chapter 4, verse 15, we can ask for the will of God to be done with the tongue. Is that a good thing? Absolutely. James chapter 5, verse 13, we can pray and we can sing praises to God with our tongue. Of course, that's a good thing. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 14, we can call on our elders and ask for healing prayer with the tongue. And in James chapter 5, verse 16, we can confess our sins to each other with the tongue. And so James lays out all these good things that we can do with the tongue. But here's the deal. Just as we can do good things and say good things with our tongues, we can also say things that are bad. We can also say things that are destructive. And James talks about these things as well throughout the book. James chapter 1 verse 13, he says we can use our tongue to blame God when we're tempted. In James chapter 2 verse 3, we can use our tongue to show favoritism toward people. In James chapter 4 verse 1, we can use our tongue to quarrel with people that we go to church with. In chapter 4, verse 11, we can use our tongue to slander and to judge a brother and sister in Christ. In James chapter 4, verse 16, he says we can use our tongue to boast and to brag. In James chapter 5, verse 9, he talks about how we can use our tongue to grumble. In James chapter 5, verse 12, we can use our tongue to swear and to make oaths that we have no business making. And so we can use our tongues in a good way, but we can also use our tongue in a bad way. In fact, I really believe what's going on back in the first century is the church was having some problems. And James is just dealing with it. You, you had brothers and sisters in Christ who were fighting with each other, and they were gossiping about each other, and they were slandering each other's names. And James is, is dealing with it because it is absolutely tearing the church apart. Listen to me, guys. Our words matter. Say that with me this morning. One, two, three. Our words matter. Believe it. Believe it because they do. Look at James chapter 3. Let's look at verses 1 through 12. Let's notice what, what James says about the tongue. He says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships, for example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. 
Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Well, the tongue is also a fire. A world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or can a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Now the first thing that I want you to notice, go back up to verse 1. Is James talks about, or rather he cautions on being a teacher. Now some of you may be scratching your head and you may be thinking to yourself, why in this world would he caution us, warn us about being a teacher? I mean, teaching is a very noble task. Teaching is a very gifted task. And so why in this world would he caution us, warn us about teaching? Because here is what James knows. The more we speak, the more we have an opportunity to stumble. Look at James chapter 1, verse 26. I told you James really deals a lot with the tongue throughout the entire book. But notice what he says. If anyone considers himself, what church? Religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his what? Tongue. He deceives himself and his religion is what? Is worthless. James, what in the world are you saying? Well, I'm saying that there, it's, it's very possible for us to claim Christianity. And maybe we even speak like a Christian. And, and we talk like a Christian. But in those moments where we break down and we say things that we shouldn't say, where we are tearing people apart and we're slandering the name of others... He says, you're not being very Christ-like. And so he warns. He says, listen, be careful about even being a teacher. Because the more you open your mouth, the more opportunity you have to stumble. In fact, he goes on in verse 19 to say these words. He says, my dear brother, take note of this. Every one of you should be quick to what? Listen and be slow to what? Slow to speak. But the problem is we live in a culture, right, that wants to be heard. We live in a culture today that wants to speak out, that wants to be the expert, that wants to stand before a crowd and say what they want to say. We live in a culture that wants to tweet. To tweet. We live in a culture that, that wants to write something profound on Facebook. We live in a culture that wants to, I mean, just comment on every article that is out there on the Internet. We want to speak because we want to be heard. But the problem is, the more we speak, the greater the opportunity we have to stumble. I heard about a professor at the University of Arkansas, and he was running late for class, and so he was speeding. And, and so one of the police officers pulled him over and he walked up to the window and of course the professor, he said, I am so sorry, I know exactly what I was doing, I was speeding and it was wrong. And he said, you know, I just, I, I, I'm running late for class and he said, I am so sorry. 
And the police officer said, well, he said, I tell you what, he said, I, I get it. I understand, he said, this time, he said, I am going to let you off with a warning. And the professor's like, oh man, thank you, thank you so much for, for letting me off. And the police officer said, look, just slow down and drive safe. Well, the professor started thinking, you know, I am a professor in English, and it would be wrong of me not to correct his grammar. <laughs> and so he spoke up and he said, excuse me, sir. He said, it's not, you know, slow down and drive safe. It should be slow down and drive safely. And the police officer said, ah. Oh. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll be right back. And when he came back, he handed the man a ticket for $75. Sometimes we talk too much. <laughs> Oftentimes, our words get us into trouble. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 says, When words are many, what, church? Sin is not absent. Sin is knocking at the door. He says, but he who holds his tongue is what? Is wise. Also in Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 through 28, a truly wise person uses what, church? Few words. A person with understanding is even tempered. Even fools are thought to be wise when they keep silent. When their mouths are shut, they seem intelligent. Solomon says, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk so much. That's when you really get into trouble. I had a professor one time at Heritage Christian where I graduated from who stood before our entire class and he said, class, he said, what is this? And he smiled. And somebody said mouth, and he said, no, this, this right here, what, what is this? And, and finally everybody said, it's your teeth. And he said, no. He said, it is a cage. And he said, every time you open your mouth, you open that cage. And he said, and you release a beast. <laughs> that can cause a lot of trouble. Now, how many of you can relate to that? Listen, our words matter. They matter to God. And some of you may be scratching your head this morning thinking, well, Slate, I really don't get it. I mean, there's so many other things that are a whole lot worse that you could be teaching on this morning, whether it's rape or, or drug and alcohol addiction or adultery or murder. I mean, there's all these terrible things out here. And, and you're talking about the tongue? I mean, why, why is the tongue so important? Why does God care so much about the tongue? Well, let's look at another passage. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. And this is what... Solomon writes, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says the tongue can bring what, church? Can bring death or what? Life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. Why is this such a big deal? Because our, our, our tongues have the power to bring life or death. I don't know how many of you guys have experienced that. Uh, I know that, that I have personally. I, I remember when I was in the fourth grade, man, I struggled all through school. But finally, by the time I got to fourth grade, I failed. I failed the fourth grade, and I had to repeat it over. And the following year, guess what? I really believe with all my heart, because I, I remember looking at all the failing grades with all my heart, I really believe that I failed that second year, but here was the problem. They didn't want an 18-year-old in the fourth grade. You with me? <laughs> and so they passed me. And so here I am going into the fifth grade, and I'm thinking to myself, man, this is, this is too much for me. I mean, I've always heard... The school is just not meant for some people. And so I was thinking, you know, I'm just not smart enough. I, I'm just not intelligent enough. And so I was already in my mind reasoning that when I got to be 16, I was going to just drop out. And then I get to the fifth grade. 
And I had a teacher by the name of Mrs. Ellis. And every single day she would come up to me and she would tell me how smart and how talented I was. And very quickly I began to believe it. And even as my mom would pull up in the car to, to come pick me up from school, she would run out to my mom and she'd just brag on me, he is so smart and he is so talented. And for the first time in my life, in the fifth grade, guess what? For the entire year, I made straight A's and B's. And instead of wanting to miss school and drop out of school for the first time in my life at the end of the year, not only did I receive a straight A and B certificate, I received a certificate for perfect attendance. I wanted to be there. Because her, her words, the power of her words made a huge difference in my life. Listen, there is incredible life-shaping power in the tongue. You can use your tongue to encourage people and build people up and guide them and give them life. I'll never forget when I was growing up, my grandmother telling my brother and myself, one day, one day you boys will become preachers. And guess what? We both are. I'm telling you, there is power in words. It can shape a life for the good, or it can shape a life for the bad. Our words are powerful. Therefore, God cares about the tongue. He cares about you and me. And so he cares about the tongue. In fact, in Psalm chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, the psalmist writes, Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? In other words, who, who is going to be up there with you in heaven? And he says, Those who lead blameless lives and do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts, those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Did you notice the importance that God placed on the tongue in being in His presence? There's another passage that might blow some of you away. This may be a passage you've never seen before, but in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19, it says that there are six things that the Lord hates. Do you realize that? We don't usually associate hate with anything that has to do with God, right? But he says there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things that he absolutely detests. And so this kind of makes our eyes perk up. What, what is it that God hates? What is it he de detests? Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who sows white church discord in a family. Are you with me? Out of the six or seven things that are mentioned that God hates and detests, three of them have to do with the tongue. It matters to God. The things that we say matters to God. In fact, in Matthew chapter 12, and this is kind of sobering, these are the words of Jesus in the New Testament. He says, And I tell you that on the judgment day, people will be responsible for every white church. Careless thing that they've said. And he says, the words you have said will be used to what? Judge you. And he says, some of your words will prove that you are right, but he says, some of your words are going to prove that you are what? It's kind of sobering, isn't it? It kind of takes the pride away where, you know, so oftentimes we're like, yeah, I said that. Uh-huh. Yeah, man, she hammered me and I came back 
with that. You know, she, man, she didn't get another word in. And, man, we start feeling good and, 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 you know, we get this pride about ourselves. And as we're telling other people and bragging to other people, you know, we act like it's a good thing. And we'll say things like, man, I just, oh, man, I just let her know or I just let him know whatever was on my mind. And Jesus says, just remember, you're going to be responsible for the careless things that you say. You're going to be judged by the words that you say. Notice what James says about the tongue. It's kind of interesting. He says it's set on fire by hell. And I think what he means by that is Satan knows well the potential for the tongue to do evil. And so he targets the tongue. He loves to put us in position to where we are just ready to speak or we're ready to lash out or we feel like we have got to say something when we have no business saying anything. That's why I think David said in Psalm chapter 141 verse 3, he says, post a guard at my mouth, God. Set a watch at the door of my lips. God, guard this mouth. Help me not to say things that are going to tear people down. Help me not to say things that are not true, that are gossip and, and slander. Help me not to say things that are profane. Help me to say things that are going to build people up that are going to encourage. Because, you see, here's the deal, guys. Every time we speak, two things can go wrong. First of all, number one, it can misdirect our path, James says. James talks about the, the tongue as if it's like the steering wheel of our lives. Right, and he uses some really interesting examples. He, he uses a, a horse, and, and for those of you who love horses, you know that horses, I mean, really, most of them, they're, they're big animals, but they are controlled, James says, by this little bitty bit. I mean, if you control that little bitty bit, you can make that horse go wherever you want it to go. And he says, and look at these big ships. I mean, these huge ships. On the back, they've got these little bitty rudders. And whoever controls that rudder controls wherever that ship goes. And he says the same is true with your tongue. So much of where we're headed and so much of where we end up in life is a direct result of how we use our mouths. You say, well, Slate, how is that? Well, well, think about this for just a few moments. A marriage can be destroyed by the tongue. A friendship can be ruined by the tongue. A career can be devastated by the tongue. A church can be split by the tongue. You see, so much where we're going and so much where we end up has to do with this. And the things that we say. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 3 says, Careful words make for a white church. A careful life, he says, but careless talk may ruin what? Everything. I remember growing up in school, being told sticks and stones may break my bones, but what, church? Words will never hurt me. That's garbage. That's a lie. Words can hurt. And they can do a lot of damage. That's why James also describes the tongue like a fire. 
How many of you have ever gone to a place you've been before that at one point, man, it was just absolutely gorgeous. It was beautiful. It was just full of life. And then you went back maybe a year or two later and it was all completely burned down because of a, a match or a cigarette or a careless campfire. And what James is saying is, man, the tongue is no different. Through the words that we speak, we can destroy. And here's the thing that we have to learn about the tongue. Once we say it, we can never take it back. And once we say it, it just leaves behind a trail of destruction. Like a tornado. Heard about some cranes in Turkey that would fly around the mountains. And as they would fly, they would cackle. But when they would cackle, they would alert the eagles that were in the area. And these eagles would find them based off the cackling and they would kill the cranes. And so over time, the cranes began to figure it out. And so over time, what began to happen is these cranes in Turkey, before they would take up and fly around the mountains, they would go down and they would grab up as much gravel in their mouth as they could so that, guess what? They couldn't open their mouth. And they wouldn't be tempted to cackle so that they wouldn't be killed. You know, I'm sure that gravel didn't taste very good. But they got to where they needed to go because they got their mouth shut. How many of you are somewhere you don't want to be right now because you couldn't control your tongue? But then also one other thing, something else that can go wrong, and that is this, it can disconnect our praise. And I think that this is even greater because James talks about how, isn't it amazing, we praise God with the same mouth that many times we will turn around and curse man with. And, and that word curse there, it, it doesn't mean profanity. It doesn't mean what we like to term as, as cussing. When he uses the word curse, what he's talking about is speaking to or speaking about other people in a way that puts them down. And he says, let me tell you something. It shouldn't be. It's wrong. How in this world, with the same mouth that we praise and glorify our God with, in the same turn, we curse those who are our brothers and sisters? It's kind of like this story I heard a long time ago about the, the little girl who was arguing with her little brother and... Finally, she stormed out of the bedroom and went into the living room, and there was her dad sitting on the couch. And so she ran, and she jumped into her daddy's arms, and she threw her arms around his neck. Well, a few minutes later, her little brother came walking out of the room. Knowing her dad couldn't see her, she stuck out her tongue at him. But there was someone else watching. Her mom saw the whole thing and her mom stormed over there and she yanked her little girl up out of her daddy's lap and she looked at her in the face and she said, let me tell you something, honey. She said, you can't love on your father and mistreat the son of your father. And in the same sense, let me tell you something, we can't claim to love God and serve God and praise God and at the same time curse those who are made in His image, who God refers to as His children. He will not let you do it. You might do it, but you're not going to get away with it. And so don't take pride and well, I'll let them have it. And, and man, I just absolutely spoke my mind because one day we have to give an account of those careless words and those words that hurt so badly. I want to close out with this. I know we're running out of time. 
James says that no man can tame the tongue. And I don't want you to leave discouraged because here's what I want you to understand. God can do what no man can do. You and I, we can't tame it, but God can. In fact, here's, here's a prescription that I want to leave you with. First of all, consider the source. Can I tell you something this morning? The problem is really not this little thing that's in our mouth. It, it, it really has nothing to do with the tongue. The problem is right here. In fact, in Matthew 12, verse 34, this is what Jesus says, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good for out of the overflow of the white church... The heart, the what? The mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. In other words, it really, it has nothing to do with the tongue, but it has everything to do with our heart. The tongue is tied to the heart. And so whatever's in here is going to spill out. It's kind of like if I were to have coffee with me this morning and you were to bump me, guess what's going to come out of that coffee cup onto you? My coffee. If it were Coke, if it were Sprite, if it were water, whatever's on the inside of that cup, when it gets bumped or it gets jostled or it gets jarred, is what's going to come out. And if there's foul stuff... If there's discouraging stuff and slander and gossip and judgment and all that kind of stuff coming out right here, then it all stems back to right here. And so consider the source and just know that God can give you a new heart with a new and a right desire and a new spirit. In fact, that's my second point, surrender to the Spirit. Surrender to the Spirit. You see, the tongue can't be controlled by natural man, but the tongue can be controlled and led and guided by the Holy Spirit of God. And so we've got to push away the flesh and we've got to live in the Spirit or else in Ephesians 4, 29 through 30, he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not what, church? Grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do you realize that you can grieve the Holy Spirit? And you do that by saying things that tear others down. Don't surrender to the flesh. Surrender to the Spirit of God. And so this morning, we're going to go ahead and extend an invitation. If there's someone here today that maybe you're, just, you're ready to give your life to Jesus, let me tell you something. There is no greater confession. There's no greater words that you could say than to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And, and if you want to know more about Jesus, we would love to tell you how you can come to Christ and have all your sins completely washed away. Or today, if you are a Christian and, and maybe there's something you're struggling with, maybe it's that God will guard your mouth and guard your heart. We'd love to pray for you. We're here together. We're, we're a family. There's not a one of us who are perfect. But as Wayne led us in the song just a few moments ago, it's just one step at a time. And maybe for some of you, that's the first step. And so if you need to come, won't you come together? We stand and sing.